Hi, my name is Eud, and uh, first of all, thank you to the organizers for having me today. Um, I work on the <coughs> on the Clarity team at VMware. Um, it's the little logo at the bottom left here. Uh, we built a design system uh, and a complete uh, <coughs> Angular component library, and we built a lot of cool things in between, like uh, an icons library and things like that. Um, the point is, having to build the full Angular component library, we spend a lot of time on unit tests. Um, it makes you spend even more time on unit tests when doing a library than when doing an app because you never know how your components are going to be used. So where you might need two tests in an app, you might need ten in the library. Um, so who here has read the Angular documentation on unit testing? <laughs> okay. I cannot, so I can only recommend you go read it after this talk. There is no way for me to walk you through everything because these behind me, which are unreadable, are just the sections of that specific part of the documentation. Think of a use case, it's here. External templates, router, routed components, inputs, outputs, each has its own pattern. The problem is you have a new member on the team that comes, how do you teach them every single pattern? There is no way. So there is kind of a catch-all pattern, There's, it's mentioned twice in this documentation, it doesn't have subsections, it's pretty well hidden, and it turns out we use it everywhere, most libraries out there use it everywhere, and the Angular code itself for um, the built-in directives, structural directives, forms, also uses it. So it's a pretty safe way of testing that will catch most of the use cases you may have. So I'm gonna show it right now rather than uh, show it on the on slides because after this I want to show you how to extract the reusable parts so that you don't have to copy code from anywhere, you can just do it yourself. So before I can do this, let me introduce a quick, quick example, very simple. This is the app I'm going to use. It has some um, form component at the top that lets you two-way bind a name to it and a greeter component that can be that, that simply accepts the same name as an input in this case for the application. Uh, so let me let me go in detail because it might be simpler. The greeter component literally just says hello to the name you give it. It has an input and it says hello. The name form is slightly more involved. Uh, it's an input which has the component itself has a two-way binding. So if you're not familiar with name and name change. Uh, you can go read the template syntax part of the documentation. That's where the change suffix convention is. Um, but it's simple to a binding that you can use, as you can see in the app here, like this. This is how you obtain this kind of syntax. So this name from component has an input and has a poor man's ng model just for simplicity here, which means when I tap in the input, it fires the output of the component. And if I give it an input, it uses it at the value of the input. Anyway, it's pretty simple. I have my app. I change this, press enter, and it changes. So two-way binding on my component, and another that says hello. This project was generated with Angular CLI. And when you do so, Angular CLI creates um, kind of scaffolding for the unit test. So when you create a greet component like this one, it comes with exactly this. I have not touched it, I have not modified it. This is what Angular CLI gives you. So I'm gonna walk you through it so you can see what exactly Angular CLI does for you. So, of course, you write a spec for this specific component. These are just declarations that you can use throughout the spec after this. The first step is configure the testing module. Think of it as an ng module specifically for tests that you're just going to use and throw away after each test. Okay, <clears throat> So right now our ng module only needs a single component, the one we're going to test. The compile components is here to, in case you have external templates or things like that. Uh, a thing you might want to note is that with Angular CLI you actually don't need it because it's using Webpack behind, but they're leaving it here for safety reasons in case they want to move away from Webpack. Anyway, because of external templates, this is why this specific before each is asynchronous. You might have to fetch templates. Once the module is ready, you create your component. 
um, you get an object that is a pretty large Angular uh, testing object that has a bunch of properties and methods that you can use, but in particular it has the component instance, so the fixture here is this big Angular object. The component is the instance of greet component that I have, and of course you have to manually trigger change detection unless you specify otherwise. Uh, and from there you can expect your component to be ready. So I have the test running here. Uh, I have one for greet, I have one for name form. Pretty simple. Now, <laughs> the thing is, I want to test a component that has an input. So how do I do that? I could try and do component.name equals something. But by doing so, I'm not really testing what my user is going to, is going to do, because they're never going to use it like this. What they're going to do is exactly what app component does, which is simply use it in template with the input syntax. So <clears throat> how about we do this? This is the trick. This is what we're going to do. We're just going to use a host component, create the host component, and then test our component inside of that indirectly. So to do this, I'm literally reusing app root because app component because it's simpler. So I'm creating a test component, which is my host. Um, it has my greeter in the template and this. So very simple. Now, what does that mean? That means I'm going to use this component, create it, and the greet component will be created indirectly just because it's in the view. So I need both of them to be in my ng module, in my testing module. Now, the component I want to create is that one, the test component. If I do this, my fixture is now a fixture of a test component. And finally, this part complains because when I'm grabbing the component instance, it's a test component, not a greet component. So this is where you have to delve a little bit into the Angular testing uh, API, but it's not that difficult to think of it, like just querying on the DOM or querying with jQuery. Uh, it's a platform browser one. So we can query directly by directive, which means I can do this. Okay. So, so far so good. No compilation errors in my ID. It seems to be okay. I have my component, which is a grid component. It's still passing. We're good. Let's write a few examples. Okay, it should greet politely. So what that means is my fixture dot native element dot text content should be, should contain at least hello world right now. Uh, whoops. Anchor and Anchor CLI and I don't agree with single one double quotes. Still runs. Okay, and now you can see this test says it, oh, let me zoom this a bit. Um, this test says it greets politely. So we did update correctly. Now, how do we test the input? This is where it gets much easier than before. To test the input, So we make sure, uh, sorry, it's a name input. Input, so that, how do you test the input? Well, first, you grab the test component instance. You use the username. Notice how I have, by the way, a nice auto-completion here. It's because it's all strongly typed, which means my component insert here is a, a property of my fixture, which is itself a component fixture of test component. So everything is typed and my ID can guess everything. This can be the case in WebStorm, uh, Visual Studio, uh, all of these uh, are fine. So um, I can now give it a different property. Oops, again, thank you, Angular CLI. Um, so I can give it a different property. I just detect the changes. And now my component itself should have the name Angular NYC. Let's check this. It runs, it passes, okay? Input testing is now simply grab the host, modify the property on the host, detect changes, and check that the component itself has received the input. Very simple. Um, the greet component has the same one for time constraints. I already wrote the host component, but it's the same idea. Test component, but the form. This time I tested with two-way binding. And I'm testing 
input output. So two-way binding, same idea. I grab the host, put a property on it, detect changes, my component should have it. Now for the output, I just test the other way. I set the property on my component, I detect changes, and I verify that the host has received the output correctly. It passes, two-way binding is okay. Let me actually remove that one because it doesn't do anything. Two-way binding passes correctly and it works. Now, another thing I like to add, but this is me being a control freak, uh, is that um, it used to be that Angular didn't really clean up enough after itself, so you had to destroy the fixture manually. It now kind of does in that it doesn't destroy it after each test, but it destroys before you're running the next one, which means the last one will never be destroyed unless you actually start another one. For safety, I like doing this. And finally, when you destroy a fixture or an element in Angular, a component in Angular, it actually doesn't remove it from the DOM. Uh, it stays here because they had view to make sure that the view hierarchy was preserved and, and you could still reach stuff under that. So <clears throat> when you destroy it, I like also to just, uh, but this is, again, control freak stuff. You don't necessarily have to go through this. The destroy, we actually had the issue at some point on larger projects, and they had memory leaks before because of that. They fix it now, but just to be safe, it doesn't cost much. You can't destroy it twice. OK, we have this. See how large this is? This is the same code as here. So we've done the basic example of Angular testing, and it has huge overhead just in terms of amount of code. So let's try and extract this. So I'll just create a separate folder. Where is it? Yeah. A separate folder uh, called testing with testing utilities. OK? Now, how am I going to get files, I mean, code from different spec files to communicate with one another? Let's try something. Uh, I'm going to name this like this right now, and we'll see after. We'll see why after. And actually, I'm going to rename this that spec just to make sure it's here. So if I do this, just quick, it's a, it's a quiz time. If I do this, OK, I'm setting this to answer to 42. Then I'm going to my component spec. And I'm saying this expect this the answer to be oh my bad to be 42. Who here thinks it passes? Who here thinks it fails? Few more fails. You're right. It fails. Undefined. So okay, talk over, giving up. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, the, the trick is Jasmine does have a user context. It's an object that it binds to every single function it calls in a before each, it, and after each. And it, this lets you pass stuff from a before each to an it or to an after each without having to import anything. The problem here is TypeScript is playing with us. We're using fat arrows. Fat arrows means that this and that place is not the function, it's not the this of the function, it's the this of the external module. Same thing here, we're using fat arrows everywhere, so we have the same issue. So let me actually copy this and do it like that. Okay, now who thinks it passes now? <laughs> if you don't think it passes, you haven't listened correctly. It passes. So 42 is accessible, and, and we have it from here because it's the same object that's being bound to each function whenever you call it. Note that the important part here is that Jasmine actually destroys this object after. So this is the number one recommended way to avoid memory leaks when you're doing unit tests. There is no references like this let that just leaves and lingers after you've done your test. There is nothing like this. The reference and any property on those references, the, the object this and any property on this are destroyed and don't have any references to them anymore, so they can be garbage collected. So that's how you fight memory leaks. So now that we have this, okay, let's 
take our huge piece of code here and try and extract it. So what do we notice? <clears throat> First, we notice that there are two, basically two components, there are two pieces that we need. The tested component itself, in this in here it's greet, and the test component, which is the host. This is what we did for greet, this is what we did for name form, so we just need two types, the type of the component and the type of the host. So what we'll do is we'll create uh, a method that we can call, to which actually, let me export function. Uh, we can create that method that, that we can create a method that sets up all those before each and after each and all that. So we need the type of the tested component. Let's go with type of any for now. Uh, the angular one, yes. And the type of the host component. Okay. There you go. So now we can, inside of this, just do it before each. Actually, we don't need that one. We can now use all these inside of here. Let me import all the Angular testing utilities and methods and stuff like that. By, okay. There you go. So grid component is the one we're testing. Host component is the one, it's the host. And we can just now bind to this, right? So notice that the before each declares the fixture on this, after each destroys the fixture on this, we're just passing stuff around. That means here we can just now init context for grid component with host test component. Removing that and adding our this a few times. And let's see, it passes. There you go. I wrote a generic class with types next to, I mean, in a util, and I now have a spec file that's much more readable. I don't need any of those imports anymore. I don't need the Angular stuff. I need this, and that's it. I just init my context and go straight up to writing the actual unit test. So no more overhead on that part. Now, you're going to say, yeah, but if I go this dot something, I completely lost my typing. It was so useful before, right? How do we, how do we get that back? So there's actually this trick in TypeScript where you can type this. So if I'm going with a function like this, and I say, in this function, I'm binding it to an array of numbers. If I go this, I have push, concat, everything. I just type this. It's not an actual argument of your function. If you put an argument that's called this, it's going to type the context of the function. It's not going to be an extra argument. And since I typed an array of number, if I try to push 42 as a string, apart from the single quotes, I get that argument of type 32 is not assignable to parameter of type number. So you get the full typing power. So, okay, what do we need in our context? This is why this file is called test context. So let's create an interface for it. So far, just do it like this. We have a fixture. right now of any and a component of any of type any right this is what this is the only thing we add to it any is really not useful so this is where we're going to delve a little bit deeper in in typescript and we're going to do pa type parameters so <clears throat> in here i would like this to be a type that's given to me by the user and this to be another type that's given to me by the user I'm naming them T and H because tested and host. It's pretty simple, but that's how you give it. So now, just by doing this and telling TypeScript, the user is going to give me a type of T and a type of H and just infer everything from there. This is the power of strong typing, is that you can infer everything from, very, from just you know, function calls. So that means our test context is going also to need those two. It's going to have a component fixture of type H, actually, because that's the host, and a component of type T. Okay, 
let's use this test context here. So we just said, if I type here, so this is going to be a bit verbose for now. Uh, my bad. Test context of grid component because that's the test component, tested component, and test component because that's the host component. Oops, that's the one. Okay, let me see if I go this. I got component and fixture on it. If I go fixture dot, sorry, component instance dot. I get username because it's a fixture of test component which has a property username so it knows that all the way down it can autocomplete here. Autocompletion is cool, but it also means it's type checked. Whenever we compile everything and run the test, I would get a build error instead of a runtime error which are so much easier to debug. So the problem here is this is a bit verbose, so you can do a little trick by saying for each spec if you really want to, you add a custom type here saying the context for all this spec is going to be this type. And from here, you just do this. Okay, let's check. Still running fine. We got it. I can even go component instance of username. It correctly goes to the right place. It tells me this is a, oh, my bad. This is IntelliJ being a bit. <laughs> Sorry, than usual, but I still have my, my auto completion here. So I, I do get <coughs> all of this, including, I mean, the TypeScript service does it better than IntelliJ, but I'm offline right now. And now let's see why is this so dry? Why is it so much better than before? Well, I'm just going to copy that. Actually, I don't even need this. I'm just going to copy that, replace all of this here. This is going to be my name form component. This is still a test component, poorly named because it's the same name, but it's an actual different component because it's a different host. Uh, still running my this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. Just for type checking, I'm going to add that this is a test context uh, of name form and uh, test component, that's the host, just for type checking reasons. And see, it's already complaining because I forgot I had a fat arrow here. So very useful. Otherwise, I would not have seen the error. Just because I typed, I got a big red line saying, you're doing something wrong, you're using this binding with a fat arrow. And now I go back to my tests, and they're still all passing. These are my specs now. Init context, run it. Init context, run it, run it. Anyone joining the team, they just do this. They don't have to learn the, how many was that? 49 sections of the Angular testing documentation. They should, but they can jump directly in and at least start writing some unit tests. Okay, so back to the slides. What did we learn? <clears throat> so first, unit test setup is a single function call. So much faster, so much easier. Then, the user context in Jasmine actually fights memory leaks. We did this on a large project. We actually caught memory leaks and were finally able to run all of the tests at once instead of having to parallelize them, just, just by doing this. Uh, we also preserved proper typing, which was really important. It's optional, right? But without it, it kind of loses the benefits of doing the other way. And finally, and this is actually really important, um, we only have a single file to maintain, so if the paradigm changes, if Angular's testing API changes, which happened already a few times, you only have one place to modify. Remember the compile, compile components after the testbed configuration? It wasn't here initially. They added it later because they, had, they needed to, for a sync, to make the test synchronous after this. Well, we just modified in one place, and there, there it was. We didn't need to go through every single one of our specs. So <clears throat> the code for this demonstration is up on GitHub. Uh, I'm going to leave that side so you can screenshot or take a picture or whatever you want. Um, the code on, the, on GitHub here is actually a bit more complex. It has a few more options, which I can go through if I have time. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but it has 
more features to make it more flexible and adapt to larger projects because right now we only showed a couple dummy cases, but sometimes you need more. Sometimes you actually do need to import a library just to test your component. So there are several ways to do that, just adding additional module metadata. All right. Um, generally, it's the user interface unit testing. I see you're looking for particular elements if they're in the in the. Okay. So, you mean if I take this one here? I'm yeah, you're looking for native element. You're looking if it's there. So actually, here I'm not. I'm not looking for a particular element. I'm looking for a component instance. So if you look at the at the helper, I'm saying give me a directive inside my host that's instantiating my Greek component or that's instantiating my name form component. I would the host, I would the, the component. I know they're both in here. I'm not saying I need a specific element. I'm not delving into the view of my component. I'm just requesting it like this. Um, sometimes you do need to, uh, but it's something, something we really try to avoid. The reason we're going by directive here and not by something else is because this function here is actually reusable if you're testing an attribute directive. You don't need to know which, comp which element it's on. You just request by directive, it gives you the directive and gives you this instance. Does that so, answer your question? So the question, the root of the question was, at what point do you just trust that whatever it is was supposed to show will be showing? For example, if an input is going through, you're detecting an ng change, and that's it. So the way the way I recommend doing it, um, I'm not a, a. It's not necessarily the only way, but the way I recommend doing it is. So this is a slightly poor example. Um, here, I would not just test if it shows. I would test two things. I would test the input exactly like this. I modify the host. I check that the test component. Mm -hmm tested component has the property. Mm -hmm. And then in here, I would say this, that the component directly, if I set its property directly to Angular NYC, mm -hmm. I want it to show Angular NYC. So what I'm saying here is that I'm testing two things. Instead of passing the input and checking if it's shown, I'm first testing, passing the input and checking that it's received, mm -hmm. and then directly setting on the component itself and checking that it's displayed. Mm -hmm. So once you take testing that, template you API. you taking that second step to see if it's displayed? Exactly. So this is what I'm doing here. I'm testing. I'm not delving into the native element. I'm just checking that currently, actually, it's hello, Angular NYC. I'm just checking that hello, Angular NYC is displayed somewhere on the page, which is good enough for me. I could and, and trim and make sure it's the only and thing. But do you recommend taking that extra step? I recommend taking that extra right. step because otherwise, if the input doesn't pass if the input isn't not received, both tests are going to fail and you're going to have to investigate why. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, if the input, if for instance, let me show you quickly, if I remove this, it's going to fail mm -hmm. saying, oh, can't find to name, my bad. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Um, I mean, uh, I just yeah. want to see what the strategy so that you recommend with respect to testing. That's that's the one. How far? Say. Where does unit testing end, and where does end end testing start? So what you have to know is that any input has to be public, mm -hmm. because otherwise you get typing errors when you're trying to right. I mean, ahead of time when you compile ahead of time. So because of that, you know you can use it in your template and check the public input on the other side to see if it has been received, and then you do the other step. You split the two. And that way you know exactly when something fails, if it's the input that's not being passed, because sometimes, uh, my bad, sometimes uh, if I, we have an issue, for instance, where we have to prefix everything. So if you go with my prefix, you're going to go something like this. But what if I made a typo and I type this? Mm -hmm. My unit is going to fail, and only one of them is going to fail, the passing the input part. Because the other one, I'm just directly setting the property, and this is type checked. So yes, I really recommend splitting both if you have the time, if you can go as far as doing this. Yeah. Thank you. So here, for instance, I can only declare this. But say I need to import clarity or material or any other library for specifically testing one component. In that case, I can just add a module metadata property. Uh, metadata property, which is going to be a test module metadata. 
And just because I don't want to break every test I wrote, I'm going to make it optional. So by default, it's going to be an empty object, OK? And that means if you want to allow, so I, I can do it quickly. Uh, so I'm going to showcase a few cool things in, um, in TypeScript. So I want a shallow copy of this module metadata because if I modify it and my consumer is using it for every test, I'm going to modify it for every test and it might just grow gigantic, which I don't want. So thank you, TypeScript. This is a shallow copy of my metadata. Uh, it's just a const. So awesome TypeScript feature here. Uh, then say if I, my, if I have, no, if my metadata that, if I don't have metadata declaration, I'm going to go metadata. Well, actually, no. Sorry, I didn't prepare that one. Uh, yeah, um, so let's go with another one. Declarations equals uh, tested type and host type. Then my <coughs> if I have metadata, uh, modular metadata, that declarations, I'm going to go declarations that uh, sorry, yeah, the push, and I'm going to push thank you TypeScript again, or ES6, uh, module bit metadata, the declarations. Okay, so now my declarations array is the tested type, the host type, plus whatever the user needed to declare on top of that to test its component. And here, finally, instead of this, we now have metadata, and we just override the declarations with our declarations. There you go. And that, if I'm not mistaken here and I didn't break this, uh, this was it. Hello, world. It should pass. It doesn't. Can't bite to name. Yeah, I put the name somewhere. I don't know where. Uh, good point. Hmm. <laughs> it's somewhere. <laughs> uh, and bind to name, oh, yeah, of course, upgrade. Because I changed, I renamed it here, my bad. Uh, where is it? Uh, I, I just forgot this one. That's all. There you go, and now it passes. Okay, so that way, if I wanted to add, for instance, a specific provider, and like here, I could just do pass providers and my array of providers that I want. You know. And there, and this provider would be available for all the components instantiated during this test context. So you can just pass more module metadata for larger projects where you actually need to import, say, a library just to test one component because you're using the date picker for that library. That's it. So this is actually an example that's showcased in the, on the GitHub repo. So you can go check this out. Well, thank you. <laughs>